If Tangine is down with inclusivity, should be good enough for the rest of us, right? Hello everybody and welcome back to the Horror Movie Syllabus. My name is Professor Victor and I'll be your host as we go through all of the essential, noteworthy, interesting, and notorious modern horror films. If you're new to the channel, I recommend you check out our introduction video. There's a link to that in the description below. It'll give you a pretty good idea of what the horror movie syllabus is all about, but in short, we take a look at a particular subgenre of horror and then we pick three movies from that subgenre to explore. That said, today we're continuing our doctorate level series where I revisit a previous subgenre that we've already done a video about, give you a quick recap of that video in case you missed it, and then we add a fourth doctorate level selection, a little bit of a deeper cut or lesser known movie to the conversation about that subgenre. Today we're revisiting the subgenre of LGBT plus horror movies, and this is a very rich subgenre. And when we talked about it in the previous video, we explored a lot about how the representation of the LGBT plus community uh, is not great in horror in general. Uh, it, it's it's either no representation or, or oftentimes stereotypically negative representation. Uh, you get a lot of uh, people from the community being portrayed as victims or, or worse killers or even worse than that monsters um you know villainous and and sick a lot of the times uh and you know a lot of these are more dated movies admittedly so but uh it is not a great representation by and large and it seems noteworthy when you get positive portrayals or positive representations of that community and those movies should be celebrated and looked at and we do look at those movies but we also want to talk about the ones that show the negative representation or show some of the negative attitudes towards this community uh so it's kind of good to get a, a few of both sides of that uh, spectrum in terms of uh, what representation of the LGBT community looks like in horror movies. And that's what we spent a lot of time talking about in the video. The movies we talked about showed kind of a wide array of different depictions of the lifestyles. Uh, and some good, some bad, most kind of in between. Uh, and, and we did take a good hard look at what that meant uh, in a macro level, what it meant uh, in terms of representation for the community, but also on a micro level what it meant in those movies. And that's really kind of where we stayed with our focus for the most part. But if you didn't see our previous video, don't fret because we're about to recap the movies we talked about right now. The first movie that we talked about in the previous video was A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge. And we talked about how we had already previously talked about it a bit when we talked about the original Nightmare on Elm Street movie. We kind of talked about the entire franchise, the entire series. So we had touched on Part 2 already, but we felt like Part 2 needed its own discussion here in the LGBT plus horror subgenre because it really is an interesting movie because of all of the gay subtext that is really basically text. It's it's pretty overt, especially nowadays you look at it and it seems very, very obvious. Uh, and it, supposedly the, the, the screenwriter of the movie did not think that he was being so obvious by putting this gay subtext in the movie, but he missed the mark on that. It's a really interesting detail that, that got explored in the documentary made about Mark Patton, the, the star of the movie. Uh, it's called uh, Scream Queen uh, and it's really, really good. Uh, we talked a bit about how it explained explored the kind of the impact of, of those subtextual images and scenes and whatnot that were in the movie and how they've kind of transformed this movie from a, a basically a rote slasher sequel into something of a, a, a celebrated gay movie. Uh, this movie has a bit of a reputation and that's why we wanted to talk about it separately on the syllabus on its own. The next movie that we talked about was Stranger by the Lake. And Stranger by the Lake is a little bit of a lesser known movie, but a very high quality, really well reviewed and well regarded movie for those who have actually seen it. Uh, and it, it's kind of Hitchcockian in its uh, in its notion of being this thriller about you know gay men who go to this beach to hook up, and one of them is is killing uh, other gay men. And so the idea of this man who meets another man who he's interested in, but also might want to kill him is a really great pot boiler type thriller movie that works extremely well, but it is, you know, a hard watch for some people because of the, the graphic depictions of sex and nudity in the movie, which are pretty extreme. Uh, and we talked about that in the video along with how the portrayals of the community in this movie are both positive and negative. You've got the, the kind of the spectrum right in one movie, you've got, you know, your literal villain, a killer who is gay, and you've got your protagonist who is gay, and you've got other characters who are gay who are, you know, positive portrayals. It really is a wide range of 
depictions of people, which is great because it's really more realistic. You know, there are all kinds of people in the community and this movie just treats, you know, gay people as just people. It's a refreshing take, uh, uh, especially for the time that this movie comes out. And it really is just a great movie, uh, you know, setting aside the, the LGBT aspect of it. Just a really, really well made, really good movie. So if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. Uh, but we did spend a lot of time talking about that one because I absolutely loved it. And the last movie that we discussed was Cruising, which, unlike Stranger Bell Lake, is a rather well-known and notorious movie, rather controversial for its depiction of the community, uh, in particular the gay club scene and the, the BDSM community. Uh, really, really not a great portrayal of it. Uh, and, you know, it's made by William Freakin, and it stars Al Pacino, so it was meant to be somewhat mainstream, but it definitely wasn't a mainstream movie. Uh, and it's got a lot of risque stuff in there, although I have to admit, when I finally got around to seeing the movie, not as risque as I had thought it was going to be, and I talked about that in the video. Uh, it really is uh, an interesting historical uh, lesson to learn from this movie and the attitudes about homosexuality at that time and the club scene in particular at that time and how uh, Friedkin was being uh, was being influenced by real life events that were going on and yet the community reacted very poorly to this. They protested it. We talked about all this in the video. We even talked about Paul Bateson, uh, a real life gay serial killer who, who was uh, connected to William Friedkin because he was in The Exorcist. It's a great story. You should go back to the other video and check it out. I won't retell it here. Uh, but the movie Cruising is notoriously uh, difficult to deal with uh, in terms of the portrayals of the community and uh, you know the message that's being sent in terms of depravity uh, uh, and 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 debauchery and things like that. That you know these these negative stereotypes. The negative stereotypes are on full display there. Uh, but the movie itself is actually kind of interesting and good. So uh, kind of a tough one to, to, to evaluate, but we did talk about it uh, and kind of tried to evaluate the merits versus the demerits of the movie. So those are the movies we talked about in our previous video, and now it's time to get into a fourth doctorate level selection. Our doctorate level selection is a movie called Spiral. And Spiral came out in 2019 and is not to be confused with that other movie Spiral or that other other movie Spiral. This is the movie that came out in 2019, uh, yet it takes place in the mid-90s. Uh, and it's about a gay couple and their teenage daughter who leave the city and move out to a small town out in the, on the, the countryside uh, for a kind of a slower paced life uh, and maybe kind of get away from kind of the drama of being a gay couple in the mid-90s, uh, only to find that their new community that they're living in uh, may not be the most welcoming community in the world. There's some weird stuff going on, but is it homophobia or is it something far, far more sinister? To tell you that would be spoiling it and you know I don't want to do that, so we'll go ahead and stop right there. But the movie is a really interesting slow burn mystery movie. And I do love me a good mystery and this one does it really, really well. Right from the beginning, you're getting the sense that there's something off with this new town. And, you know, it's a horror movie, so you could probably gather that, that was going to be the case. But you're kind of wondering where it's going to go. And the movie does a really good job of hiding the ball for a very long time. You're not quite sure if you're getting something, you know, killer-ish or supernatural-ish or paranormal-ish. Uh, it really kind of holds its cards close to the vest. And that was a great thing because leaving me wondering what was going on really drew me into the movie and got me engaged really, really fast. It doesn't hurt that it's a really well-made movie, very well shot. The acting is all particularly good, uh, especially Lachlan Monroe, who I tend to really like. Uh, but everybody across the board is very good in this movie. And it's nice to see this positive, realistic portrayal of a gay couple. Uh, again, this movie's not made in the 90s, but it's set in the 90s. And have it been made in the 90s, I'm not sure that the portrayal would have been quite as positive and quite as realistic as, as it winds up being. But uh, it's nice to see a refreshing gay couple that is just a gay couple uh, but it's not like they just happen to be gay. Their homosexuality is a key ingredient or a key plot point of the movie because of this perceived homophobia in the town. Uh, again, it's not clear whether or not it's true homophobia or if one of the characters is being paranoid, and I really liked them taking that angle in the movie. But what it winds up doing is putting an interesting twist on homophobia because, and again, I don't want to spoil the movie, so I won't go into this too much, but the way it portrays uh, the attitudes towards uh, gay people in general, uh, or just other people, uh, you know, widely speaking, is really interesting. It has an interesting allegorical spin on homophobia. Again, I'm dancing around this a little bit, but I really liked the way they tackled this subject and had something to say about it without uh, being trite or obvious or kind of just repeating the same 
beats that you've probably heard in other movies or seen in other areas or read in articles or whatever. This tried to do something slightly different and send a message that maybe isn't the clearest of message when you get to the ending, and we'll get to that in a second, but I still appreciated the effort. I still appreciated the uh, the intent to do something a little bit different, a little unique, a little bit spooky and mysterious, it worked for me. It worked really, really well. And again, harder to explain why without spoiling it, but it worked for me. Uh, I did like the 90s setting, and I think it was important to have it set in the 90s so that the mystery of whether or not you're facing traditional homophobia is... is is a little bit more relevant and believable than it might be now. And of course, it solves some questions about like being able to use cell phones and stuff like that. In fact, uh, it's sometimes easy to forget that the movie's set in the 90s until you see like an old computer or realize that somebody's not using a smartphone or something like that. It makes it a lot easier to explain why they don't have those things. But it's funny because a lot of the uh, overt uh, attitudes that you see in, displayed in the movie from neighbors and from the daughter and from other people uh, seem very progressive, maybe too progressive for the mid-90s, frankly. Uh, but I liked that. I liked that it was kind of lulling you into this sense of forgetting that the, the, the world in the movie is not as progressive as the world is now. Uh, and and so I liked that they kind of kept letting you forget that it's the 90s and then just sort of casually remind you by having some old tech show up. That was a nice touch. It was a good way of doing things. Now, I mentioned the ending, uh, and I think it's a good ending. I like the ending quite a bit, but it does end without any real true explanation. It's not an ambiguous ending. And you know I like me an ambiguous ending. It's not an ambiguous ending, but it doesn't really completely explain what it is you just saw. And I liked that. I liked leaving it up to me to fill in the blanks. I like that it made me feel like I wanted to rewatch the movie again to see if I could suss it out a little bit better. Spoiler alert, I didn't. I watched the movie again for this video, uh, and I, I don't think I'm any clearer on what exactly is happening, but I don't think I need to be clear on what's happening. I get the general sense, the general vibe of what's happening. I don't think I need it spelled out for me. I don't think I need the mystery completely detailed. I think I, I got enough to know generally what's happening and I felt satisfied by that, but maybe not everybody else would agree with that. I do like that the allegory that they're trying to set up is scalable. And by that, I mean, you could keep this story going uh, and changing the protagonist or changing the identities of the protagonist, if you follow where I'm going with that, and it would still work. They even allude to this at the end of the movie, and I really liked that. Um, but I also wonder if that muddies the message a little bit, because it's very clearly focused on, you know, homophobia. Uh, and then at the end, it kind of, you know, has this ability to focus on other, you know, racist or bigoted ideals. Uh, and, and I like that. But it also kind of dilutes the homophobia message a little bit. But that is a very minor quibble on a movie that I thought was really, really good. I liked the mystery. I liked the quality of the filmmaking quite a bit. The characters were good, uh, both the, the the you know the protagonists and the you know the neighbors that may or may not be villains. They are interesting characters. They felt more well rounded and not quite so cliche or or stereotypical. I felt that they were fleshed out pretty well, and I enjoyed that. I connected with them and wound up getting really drawn into the movie as a result. This one got a bit of buzz when it came out. It was pretty well received, pretty well reviewed. Uh, and so in 2019, when it hit, I mean, it wasn't a huge hit or anything like that. I think it was actually straight to streaming, but uh, it really had a good positive buzz and it lived up to that. Uh, you know, I went in with it, some high expectations for it and I felt it met those expectations. I really enjoyed this movie. It felt like it was worth talking about. I had it already made the syllabus at that point. So I decided, you know, this would be a good one for our doctor level selection. So here we are talking about it because while it did get well received, I still don't think it gets... Uh, as well known as those other spiral movies, uh, that movie that, that title is very popular for some reason. And I'll be honest with you, it's not super clear to me why it is here. Like you know, the best I can say is that you know, in the third act, things get a little bit more spooky and things start to spiral out of control. In fact, on on both watches, I would say that the mystery part of the movie really holds up well. And in the third act, it starts to spin out of control a little bit, spiral out of control, if you will. But it doesn't lose it. It stays together. And at the end, it winds up nailing the ending, at least for me. Uh, so I think maybe there's a meta, meta reason why that might be called Spiral, but it didn't really tie all together very well with the title. 
but I don't care. Um, I, I just really think it's a good movie and I think it's underseen. So if you haven't seen it, by all means, check it out and let me know what you think in the comments below. But if you have seen it, also let me know in the comments below what you think because uh, I'm pretty high on it and I'd like to know if anybody else is as well. So that's our doctorate level selection, but if you enjoy this subgenre, I've got an extra credit selection for you as well. And this one's really good too. This movie's called Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker came out in 1981 and is surprisingly well received uh, and well reviewed, at least nowadays. Maybe not so much when it originally came out, but there seems to be a lot more of a positive attitude about this movie and exploring the 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 gay themes uh, that are in the movie uh, and and the ideas behind it and some of the representation of it, which has aged somewhat well, uh, all things considered. But we're going to get into that in just a minute. First, if you haven't seen it before. The movie is about a woman who takes care of her teenage nephew whose parents died in a car accident and she is struggling with the idea of him leaving the home to go to college. She doesn't want him to leave and she clearly has some mental health issues that need to be addressed but she is getting more and more unstable as he gets closer and closer to leaving the house and when a man comes and she winds up reacting poorly to him and killing him claiming that he tried to rape her uh, things get uh, really complicated as a homophobic cop starts to investigate and try to pin the crime on her nephew. And I'll stop there so as to not spoil it for you in case you haven't seen it, but the movie is kind of your stereotypical slasher movie, but also not. And the reason why is because of this, you know, this gay aspect to the movie. Specifically, there is a gay character in the movie. It's the basketball coach of your protagonist uh, boy, the nephew, uh, and he is portrayed really, really well. He's just a gay man. He's not a villain. He's not a creep. He's not a pervert. He is just a man who who loves men. Uh, and he is the impetus for this uh, homophobic cop to start investigating. And the, the homophobic cop is over the top. Uh, and over the top is kind of where the bread and butter is of this movie. This movie is quite a bit campy, and I think somewhat intentionally so, and it works really, really well. But I'll get back to that in a second. I think the reason why this movie has endured uh, instead of just being a forgotten slasher like so many others from the early 80s is because of this gay aspect. Not only is it uh, one of the earliest portrayals, uh, positive portrayals of a gay man in, in horror movies, especially in a slasher movie, but it also puts that homophobia front and center as a bad thing, as a negative thing. And I think that's why uh, modern day reviews of this movie have treated it much more kindly than the earlier reviews, which really just kind of focus on the schlockiness of it and the violence of it and things like that, and tore it apart like they tore apart so many other slashers. Nowadays, modern critiques of this look at these gay themes and say, hey, there's something going on here that's pretty interesting. There's a lot of positive portrayal of the LGBT community going on here and a little bit of a negative portrayal of of heterosexual culture here because the aunt uh you know has a, a bit of this oedipal complex where she has raised this boy as her own son but seems to be attracted to him there is a lot of hints of like incestual feelings for him and it's really uncomfortable and bizarre and creepy and it works really well in terms of making the movie you know really kind of eerie and gross and hilarious and and uncomfortable and all of these things, uh, but also sends this interesting message about, you know, the the heterosexuality being a bit depraved or, or, or wrong, uh, or really a better way of saying it is it's a counterpoint because you've got characters literally in the movie talking about how homosexuality is depraved and, and wrong and debauched, and yet the, the characters that are that way are the heterosexual characters. They're the ones that are being, you know, unchristian and terrible and doing bad things. It makes for a nice inverse of what you would normally see at this time uh, in, in movies, especially in horror movies, and it works really, really well for me. The other thing that works really well are the performances. In particular, Susan Tyrrell as the aunt is absolutely fantastic. She steals the show because she is way over the top, way crazy, uh, and just really big and, and campy and fun, and it works. It makes for a blast of a watch. This is a fun movie to watch, uh, and and the other characters are pretty good, too. There's a young Julia Duffy in there who's doing solid work as the girlfriend who's really kind of like the way a, a male protagonist would be in usual slasher movies with the with the uh, the young boy, the, the nephew, being your final girl, if you will, and being, you know, accused of being uh, gay in the movie. Uh, it's interesting, and, and, you know, they don't really ever answer that question either, which is interesting. You know, he's got a girlfriend, but 
maybe he has some homosexual feelings. They don't really delve into that too much, but they, they leave it there as not necessarily a bad thing, which I thought was good. There's a young Bill Paxton in the movie, uh, kind of chewing scenery too. He's really over the top also as a kind of a bully. Uh, the guy who plays the cop is really great. Uh, you know, he's just, again, he is so vile and, and evil as this homophobic cop who's just trying to pin this crime on this boy that it's, it's it's almost laughably bad, uh, but in a fun way. This movie really rides that line, that camp line, really, really well. Uh, and I liked how they, you know, they did put these themes in uh, of, you know, homophobia being a problem, but then also kind of undercutting it by showing that the heterosexuals in the movie are the ones that are the negative people, the bad people, the villains in the movie. Really interesting choice. Uh, that said, the movie's still also presenting a lot of gay stereotypes in a way that isn't necessarily debunked. You know, they're talking about how, you know, this boy was raised by women, uh, and maybe he's not as manly and stuff like that. And so uh, they're kind of reinforcing these these gay stereotypes that weren't really true, uh, but they're not really refuting them either. So there's a, a question to be said about whether or not this is really that positive a portrayal uh, of the LGBT community, the gay community in particular. Um, but I'd say overall, I think it is, just by virtue of having a, a gay couple in the movie that are not gross or terrible. Uh, you know, this, this gay fo uh, basketball coach is a really cool character. He winds up being really good. He doesn't get killed off. Spoiler alert, I suppose. But it's like, important to mention that, you know, a lot of things that would happen with gay people in these movies may be killed, like they were being punished for being gay or something. He doesn't die. I think that's important and noteworthy. I mean, I don't want to mislead you. It's not like this is the greatest movie ever. It's still, you know, kind of an exploitation slasher, slasher movie from the early 80s. It's not, you know, super duper well made, but it's not boring. It's not, you know, bad quality. The acting is intentionally over the top and fun. Uh, it's a good time. It's a good ride. And I do think it's got a good positive message overall. So I definitely think this is one to check out. And if you haven't seen it, I would definitely recommend it. But if you have seen it, let me know what you think in the comments below, because I'd like to know in particular, do you think it's a positive portrayal or do you think it still kind of falls into some of the negative tropes that came out around that time? Uh, I do think there's an argument to be made either way. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on the matter in the comments down below. So that's going to do it for our revisiting of the LGBT plus horror subgenre. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of great movies in, in the subgenre and we really only kind of scratch the surface. So if you've got other ones that you can think of that I haven't talked about, leave them in the comments below for us to all look at and, 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 and you know, maybe check out because there's so, so much that doesn't get enough shine or enough attention that it's hard to spotlight everything that needs to get spotlighted uh, in just the limited time that we have here. Speaking of time, it is time for us to do a horror trivia pursuit card. Uh, and as usual, I'm going to answer this question on camera so you can see whether or not I am cheating. And let's go ahead and go with the killer subgenre uh, or category on this card. Uh, and it's, you know, in honor of the Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker slasher movie. So we're going to do the killer category. And here's the question. What director made 1997's Funny Games and its shot for shot 2008 American remake? And I know the answer to this question. I know the answer to this question because we've talked about the the, the Funny Games movie and the remake both on this channel. Uh, we've talked about how they are uh, basically shot for shot and how they are made by the same director. The director remade his own movie, uh, which is noteworthy. And uh, so if you watch those videos, maybe you remember the name of this, uh, this director. I do. I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce his name. Uh, and I'm like 99.8% sure that I remember this because uh, he's also, we've also talked about him uh, elsewhere uh, on the syllabus too. Although he did not have enough points to make it on our tour top 10 directors list that we did recently. Uh, so uh, there, take that for what it, what it is. And he's not maybe one of the most mainstream or well-known, but deep cut horror fans probably know the answer to this question. Obviously I'm prattling on a little bit to give you an opportunity to think about it, but Hopefully you've got your answer because I'm about to make my guess right now. And my guess is Michael Haneke. And I'm not sure I'm pronouncing the name right, but I believe it's Haneke. Uh, Michael Haneke, who not only directed the Funny Games original movie and also the American remake of it, but he also directed the movie Caché, which is excellent. It's another movie we talked about uh, here on the syllabus. It's absolutely excellent. Haneke is a great director. He really has a good eye. He knows how to set a tone. He knows how to let a camera linger. He has great camera movements. I, I'm a big fan of what I've seen of his. I haven't seen all of his work, but what I've seen... Very, very good. Uh, so Michael Haneke is my, my answer. Let's check out the card and see if I am right. Michael Haneke, assuming that's how it's pronounced, 
That is the correct answer. Did you guys get it right? And if you didn't, who did you guess? Because I'd like to know who you guessed if you guessed wrong. Uh, but I'm glad I got that one right. I'm feeling pretty good about myself because I don't think that was the easiest question in the world, but I just happen to know that pretty well because of the research I've done for this channel. Making me smarter, hopefully making you guys smarter too. Hopefully you're enjoying this. If you stayed to the end, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Until next week, class is missed.